Falchiroiv Galer, Gudi Duhi Hyoyak, Agus Lokna on near her. Is Muran Trua Nak Wilshiv Ilar and Ganter all in special to show. Nishtama Fakens Asma Fwinyog er Lok Mask, Agus Ilan Rua, Agus is Ryark in Taka Eid. Falchiroiv, everybody, uh, as chairperson of GO Enterprise. I'm very proud to welcome every, everyone to Joyce Country and the Western Lakes Geopark Project Conference. As Geo Enterprise is a not-for-profit company which was set up to represent local and community interests. Um, it would be remiss of me today to uh, not to remember a couple of very special people who helped the whole process get, um, get started in the early days Owen Burke from Clonbur and Deirdre Kavanagh from Turmacady. Uh, they were very special people and they gave great encouragement to the whole project in the very early days. So I want to pay tribute to them. This morning, our speakers, this morning session is all about heritage of the region. Uh, and it starts with its foundation, the geological heritage with Brian McConnell from GSI. Uh, we have sessions from both our heritage officers who play a really important role in the promotion and conservation of heritage in the two counties, County Mayo and County Galway, Deirdre Cunningham uh, from County Mayo and Marie Mannion from County Galway. We then have Eugene Costello talking about uh, the whole process of bullying and farming in the past, the use of the uplands, which is a topic and subject very dear to my own heart. So we're delighted to have him. And then finally, we have uh, Padro Mirahertig, who's going to speak on the Irish from the um, Joyce country and Tourmacady areas. So, um, you know, we have a fantastic lineup this morning. Heritage and people is a huge part. While we talk about geoparks focusing on geology, it's the heritage and the people that play a huge role. Um, we often say around Clumber that it is the scenery that will take or bring people to this location, but it really needs the people to bring them back. And that includes our social heritage, um, our musical uh, heritage, our language, and the way of life, the very special way of life that we have in this region. So this morning, um, I, I'd like to give you a really good welcome. If you were here in per per person, you would actually experience the welcome that is very special in this region. So to all our vi visitors near and far, especially local, the local communities and local people, welcome to the conference. And I hope that you enjoy this morning's sessions. Uh, I will see you shortly for a question uh, and answer. So um, there'll be plenty of opportunities to give your input. And we, we especially welcome questions. All the sessions will run uh, for the next uh, 50 minutes approximately. And there will be a questions and answers session following that. So um, without further ado, we wait. There will be a, a few minutes before the start. And then we will move straight into um, our speakers, the presentations from our various speakers. So um, looking forward to it and uh, hope you, that you enjoy it as well. Gaurav Mila Mahagav. Hello and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk to the conference. I want to give you an idea of the diversity of geology that makes up the stunning landscapes of the Joyce Country Western Lakes region and the stories that are told by the rocks. This will be a personal account. I'll focus mainly on the part of the story that I'm most interested in, which is the Ordovician history of volcanoes around the closing Iapetus Ocean and the rising Caledonian Appalachian mountain range. A story that's probably better told by the rocks of Joyce Country Western Lakes than anywhere else. This is a geological map of the area that shows the main groups of rocks according to the geological setting that they represent, with a simplified outline of the currently proposed geopark extent. Within the geopark area, in the south colored yellow, we have the oldest rocks in the area, the Precambrian metamorphic rocks of Connemara. 
which are part of a group of rocks called the Dalradian, which are intruded by Ordovician igneous rocks colored pink that are the roots of volcanoes. In the Northwest are small areas of Ordovician volcanic rocks colored orange, which are enclosed in a larger area in olive green of a sedimentary basin called the South Mayo Trough. Between Connemara and the South Mayo Trough is a strip in dark green of Silurian sedimentary rocks and to the east, the Carboniferous Limestones that show such good karst features around the lakes. And I'll talk through each of these rock groups in turn. On the top left, you can see Dalradian Quartzite on the top of Ben Levy. You may be able to make out small folds within it with a distant view over the Mount Trasna Plateau. On the right is the folded marble schist rock in the outcrop at the roadside in Cornamona. And of course, the 12 Bends Quartzite Mountains below. These are examples of the Dalradian metamorphic rocks of Connemara, which were deposited sometime around 600 million years ago as sediments on the continental shelf, shelf of the ancient North American continent called Laurentia, which the northwest half of Ireland was part of at that time. By 480 million years ago, a wide ocean called Iapetus separated Laurentia from a southern continent that included the southeastern half of Ireland. That ocean began to close as the Iapetus tectonic plate was pushed under the continental margins in a process called subduction, which generated a rim of volcanoes around the ocean, just like the Pacific Ring of Fire today, shown on the top right. On the left are pillow lavas of Bencora, interlocking lava balls formed by underwater eruption of basalt lava at the Loch Nefui volcano on the Iapetus ring of fire, which is reconstructed in the bottom right. Thankfully, these pillow lavas can still be seen at the roadside in Finney, although someone had thought it a good idea to remove them, demonstrating one value of a geopark in explaining and protecting important geoheritage sites. Between the Loch Nefui volcanoes and the continent, the South Mayo Trough ocean basin was filled with sediments through much of the Ordovician period from 480 to 450 million years ago. First with deep water muds and silts shown in the top left, and then progressively shallower water and coarser sediment with river sands and gravels on the top right and deltas where those rivers met the sea on the bottom left. Those three pictures are from around Muiré. On the bottom right, you can see layer upon layer of sandstone in the upper part of the South Mayo Trough sequence here on the south side of Mount Trasna. You can also see that the layers are tilted, which is a result of folding of the rocks by compression as the Iapetus Ocean closed. In fact, the ocean closed in stages with a sequence of collisions, deformations and mountain building events. The metamorphism and folding of the Dalradian rocks was the first phase, peaking around 470 million years ago as the Loch Nefui volcanic arc of Iapetus collided with the Laurentian continent. Following that collision, the rocks of Connemara to the south of the South Mayo Trough were uplifted in an Andean type event as large volumes of magma were intruded into it. This caused a flood of coarse sediment from the rapidly eroding mountains into the South Mayo Trough Basin, as well as large explosive volcanic eruptions that blanketed the basin in thick layers of volcanic ash called ignimbrites. On the top left, you can see coarse conglomerates from the side of Bonaconine overlooking Loch Nefui, composed of pebbles and boulders of rock that can be recognized as having worn off Connemara and that were carried in an alluvial fan into the South Mayo Trough Basin. On the bottom left are igneous rocks that intruded the Connemara Dalradian at this time, paler granite cutting darker gabbro in the root zones of volcanoes that occasionally erupted to deposit ignimbrites like that seen on the top right, a paler crag of ignimbrite within darker sandstone beds high on the north crag of Muiré, and there's a person in the red ellipse for scale. On the bottom right, a close up with large pieces of pumice in the volcanic ash. This 12 meter thick ignimbrite was deposited as a single event from a very large eruption. And there are five of them within the upper South Mayo Trough sandstone sequence. 
Imagine the effect of all that volcanic ash on the environment. Although there was no life on land at the time, 465 million years ago. Here are a couple of photos to help visualize the environments of the upper South Maitroff's Andean phase. On the left, a large braided river plain washing off mountains. So imagine Connemara in the background and South Maya Trough in the foreground. On the right, thick ignobrite sheets from large eruptions in the Chilean Altiplano of the Andes today. This is my cartoon reconstruction of the tectonic setting of the Joyce Country Western Lakes area during the Middle Ordovician period. The South Maya Trough basin lies between Connemara and the Laurentian margin, receiving sediment from both sides. Connemara is rising up as it's intruded by magma and being rapidly eroded to provide fans of coarse sediment from the south. The magma comes from a, sub a subduction zone that is part of the Iapetus ring of fire. And periodically the magma reaches the surface in large explosive eruptions. But this reconstruction illustrates the Connemara conundrum. How did the Connemara block of the Laurentian continent get to the south of oceanic rocks of Iapetus? There are alternatives to this reconstruction and it's still an active research question that draws people to the Joyce Country Western Lakes area. If we could see the tectonic contact between Connemara and the Iapetus rocks, that would help, but it's hidden all along its length by that strip of overlying Silurian sedimentary rocks colored green on the map. Why those rocks are preserved just there, hiding that contact, is both a puzzle and a frustration. Those Silurian sedimentary rocks were deposited as the Andean phase mountains collapsed to create new sedimentary basins. The base of the Silurian sequence is the coarse alluvial deposits seen on the top left that unconformably overlie the assembled Connemara del Radian, Loch Nefui volcanic rocks and the South Mayer Trough. Rising sea levels then flooded the land and the sediments change upwards from shallow water sands with lots of vertical worm burrows seen in the top right from near Finney to deep water rhythmically bedded sandstone mudstone layers seen in the photo bottom left from Loch Fee. The block diagram shows the Silurian sedimentary sequence blanketing the assembled elements of Connemara, South Maya Trough and Laurentia. About 430 million years ago, the final vestiges of the Iapetus Ocean were closed and the continents on either side were brought together, adding another phase of deformation and uplift to the Caledonian Appalachian mountain range that now stretched from Eastern North America across Britain and Ireland to Northern Scandinavia. The continental crust was thickened in the collision zone, causing partial melting and collection of rising magma in the crust into magma chambers that cooled and solidified between 420 and 380 million years ago, late Silurian to early Devonian times, to form the Galway granite batholith, which is now exposed at the surface throughout much of southern Connemara. The northern contact of the granite against the Ordovician magmatic arc rocks of Connemara is well exposed in Glen Trasna, just inside the southern limit of the proposed geopark area. By 360 million years ago, early Carboniferous times, the Caledonian mountains were worn down, the Galway granite exposed at the surface, and a warm shallow sea spread northwards across the assembled Ireland. Ireland was at equatorial latitude and was like the Bahamas today, a site of carbonate deposition from abundant marine life, forming extensive limestones that are preserved from the east side of Loch Mask right across the Midlands. Limestone is slowly soluble in rain and acid bog water, forming the solution features of limestone pavement, caves and springs, collectively termed karst, that are well developed in the area. All the natural drainage out of Loch Mask is through underground cave systems to emerge in springs around Kong. You probably know the bottom left photo of the pigeonhole cave where a stream can be seen flowing past at the bottom. So I've talked about a few cycles of mountain formation, erosion of those mountains, and then younger rocks deposited on top. So I want to make a general point that often comes up in discussions during field trips. While the rocks contain the evidence for past mountains, 
the actual mountains they form today are much younger. And here's a good demonstration of that. The conglomerate in the upper photo is the base of the Carboniferous succession at Round Island on the western shore of Loch Mask, just across from the Lustine Islands. But if we turn and look in the opposite direction, the same basal Carboniferous horizon is up there on top of the Montrasna Plateau, across the top of the tilted and eroded Ordovician rocks. So the mountains of Joyce Country Western Lakes have risen since the Carboniferous was deposited across the planed off remnants of the older mountains. And as we look across the bog to the majestic dirks, we see the deep carving of the uplands by glaciation, the smooth valley bottom glacial deposits, the blanket bog with its forest of 3000 year old tree stumps and the human settlement and interaction with the geology that's also part of the geopark story. I'll finish with a quick plug for a field guidebook that Geological Survey Ireland will soon publish on the geology of South Mayo, which includes the northern part of the Joyce Country and Western Lakes, Gal the Galway part of the area. This has been written by John Graham, Emeritus Professor of Trinity College Dublin, who has a long history of research in the area. It focuses on the Ordovician and Silurian rocks from Clare Island to North Corrib and includes a revised geological map of the area and provides itineraries and locality descriptions for you to explore the geology for yourself. Thanks for listening and enjoy the conference. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Deirdre Cunningham and I'm Heritage Officer with Mayo County Council and together with uh, Marie Mannion, Heritage Officer in Galway County Council, uh, we're going to give you an overview of the work that we do with, um, with local communities to conserve and promote um, local heritage within our, within our counties. The Local Authority Heritage Officer Programme is a key strategic partnership between the Heritage Council and local authorities. The network consists of um, 29 uh, city and county heritage officers throughout the country and uh, one of the key aspects of the role is to implement and uh, so to develop and implement county heritage plans and to assist in the implementation of the national heritage plan. And um, the mission of the program really is to engage, educate and advocate to develop a wider understanding of the of the a major contribution that our heritage makes to um, our social, environmental and our economic well-being. Placing heritage at the heart of public life is fundamental to everything we do. Heritage has links to tourism. It has links to our economy, our environment. It is, uh, gives us all a sense of place. The landscape is very much part of our heritage, as is our history. Um, so heritage really has a very special place in the heart and the life of the people of our counties. What is heritage then? Well, if you look at the 1995 Heritage Act, it gives 13 different areas of heritage, ranging from monuments to geology, to wildlife, to archaeology and architecture. But heritage is actually much broader than that. And when you start looking at the city and county heritage plans, you'll see it deals with built, natural and cultural heritage. The Local Authority Heritage Officer Network assists in the delivery of um, national priorities and also assists in the implementation of many national plans. Uh, these include plans such as the uh, National Biodiversity Action Plan, uh, the Heritage Council Strategic Plan, uh, the National Development Plan and um, other plans like the Climate Action Plan and the um, uh, Creative Ireland Plan. And many heritage officers are members of the uh, Creative Ireland culture teams and our local authorities. Uh, the Local Authority Heritage Officer Network also um, also uh, delivers on Heritage Council priorities and programmes and um, these include things like uh, National Heritage Week where we coordinate the, um, coordinate the delivery of Heritage Week within our counties. Other um, initiatives like the Adopt a Monument Scheme, um, the Historic Towns Initiative and we would assist uh, communities um, applying to the Community Heritage Grant Scheme and assist them then in carrying out their pro projects that are funded through that scheme and also the uh, other schemes like the uh, Gla Gloss Traditional Farm Building Grant Scheme and the Irish Wall Towns Network.
each city and county has a, either a city and county heritage plan, but in some instances, the plans may be combined heritage and biodiversity plans. The plans uh, vary in length. Some of them are five years, some are six, and some are 10 years in length. Um, they contain a number of actions that are very, very specific to either the city or county. And I suppose there's an overseeing body in each uh, city and county in that you have a city or county heritage forum. Uh, the heritage actions then really uh, relate to raising awareness, promoting best practice and gathering data. Promoting best conservation practice is a very, very important aspect of, I suppose, heritage plan and the work of uh, the heritage officers. So in the Galway, uh, from a Galway perspective, some of the, I suppose, best practice initiatives that we've undertaken is uh, for Athen Rye Wall Towns. We have created a conservation management plan, and that really is our Bible in uh, implementing uh, planned actions in relating to the conservation of the walls and uh, in the medieval town of Athenry. Uh, other initiatives are the Community Archaeology Programme, where our community archaeologist works with different sectors of the community, providing advice and guidance in relation to the management, the care and maintenance of the monuments within the, within the county of Galway. Um. So uh, we work with um, communities to assist them in enhancing uh, biodiversity in their local areas um, in partnership with uh, local groups and other stakeholders, including uh, tidy towns, uh, local development and enhancement groups. Uh, we have prepared um, both nature and wildlife plans and local biodiversity action plans for individual areas. These plans are really all about making space for nature in our towns and villages. Um, preparation of the plans involves surveying and mapping the habitats of the areas, including uh, mapping ecological corridors and green infrastructure. And uh, the natural heritage of the town is then assessed and evaluated and, um, and the plans are formulated. And really what these plans do is identify areas that are important for biodiversity in the towns and villages, um, identify air opportunities uh, where biodiversity can be enhanced, and then recommend practical measures that the community and the local authority can take to enhance and conserve natural heritage. Research and data collection to inform decision making is always, uh, I suppose, a main area that we work in. And some of this work includes graveyard audits, uh, touch audits, the audits of ecclesiastical heritage, wetland studies, holy well audits, um, also invasive species management plans and um, what we try and do I suppose is really to collect as much data as we can to assist in making informed decisions for our heritage. Galway's geological heritage is extremely important to us and I suppose it is one of the most diverse uh, geological heritage in the country. Uh, we have with the Geological Survey of Ireland and the Heritage Council um, undertaken an audit of the geological heritage sites of the county that took four years to do in, in total. Um, in all, there's 134 geological heritage sites in County Galway. And each of those sites then has an individual site report. And that information can be found on the Geological Survey of Ireland website. In addition to that, Galway County Council, working in partnership with uh, the National University of Ireland Galway, uh, undertook a survey and um, produced a publication on the Eskers of County Galway. Uh, that's available online on our website, Galway Community Heritage. In Mayo, we also undertook a report on the geological, her on the geological heritage of Mayo, and this was done in partnership with the Geological Survey and uh, with um, NUI uh, Galway. Um, 110 uh, geological heritage sites were identified and individual site reports prepared for these. And again, that's on the uh, the information is both on our website and on the um, the website of the GSI. Um, following on from the uh, following on from the audit, uh, we published a book entitled Reading the Rocks, Exploring Mayo's Geological Heritage. And really this was about disseminating the results of the survey and um, or disseminating the results of the audit. And we highlighted uh, 21 sites uh, spanning, um, spanning the diversity of geological heritage in the county. These sites could then be used by communities uh, to Sorry, these sites can then be incorporated into, into uh, trails, heritage trails that are being developed by uh, by local communities. 
Uh, we also developed a geology exhibition based on the audit, and we will hope to launch that uh, this year. Uh, many of our towns and villages have uh, significant local character, and this is based on their natural built and cultural heritage. So in partnership with local communities, we have prepared village design statements and public realm plans, uh, which aim to preserve this character and protect local distinctiveness. Uh, these documents uh, set out a share vi shared vision for the future development of the town or village, and they provide guidance for future interventions that may take place. Uh, the overall aim of these plans is to enhance the attractiveness of these areas as places to live in, to work in, or to visit. And for example, the Ballon Road Public Realm Plan has assisted with securing funding under the Heritage Council and Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage's Historic uh, Towns Initiative, um, and under the Department of Rural and Community Development's Town and Village Renewal Scheme and Rural Regeneration and Development Fund. Uh, the funding obtained has been used to enhance key historic and heritage structures in the town and also to enhance inner town spaces. Um, this investment has conserved important historic fabric and increased the attractiveness of one of Mayo's most historic towns. Uh, to promote the wealth and diversity of heritage sites in specific areas, we work with communities to develop local heritage trails. Uh, one such trail we are currently developing is with the community and local landowners in uh, Kilmavie. Uh, Kilmavie is a small village in East Mayo with the community centre and church at its centre. And within a few kilometres radius of the centre of the village, there's a wealth of archaeological and heritage sites. And these sites span thousands of years of human settlement from the early Neolithic to the 19th century. We are working with the community and local landowners to develop a trail encompassing a number of these sites. And these include uh, Bronze Age cooking sites or Fulloch the Fia, uh, Holy Wells, um, an Ohm stone, a court tomb, and uh, Kilcashel Stone Fort, which is pictured here, which is a national monument. Uh, we're installing fences and paths and other necessary trail infrastructure while ensuring that the sites and monuments are protected and also uh, developing interpretive materials for the trail. It's hoped that this trail will promote this relatively unknown part of Mayo within the wider county and also uh, both nationally and internationally. As well as local trails, we also develop countywide trails, uh, such as the Galway Ecclesiastical Trail, which Marie was involved with. And, um, and in Mayo, we have the Harry Clark Stained Glass Window Trail. Uh, Harry Clark was a world famous stained glass artist born in Dublin, and we are extremely fortunate to have Harry Clark or Clark Studio windows in 18 locations in Mayo. Uh, including um, in churches located within the proposed geopark area, um, including Kong, Kilmaine, and in Ballinrobe, there are eight beautiful Harry Clark windows in St. Mary's Catholic Church. The uh, magnificent Last Judgment window in Newport on the northeast shore of Clue Bay is the last Harry Clark window uh, that he worked on before his untimely death at the age of 41. Um, along with the trail booklet, um, a website of Mayo Stained Glass has been developed to promote the trail. In Galway, like Mayo, we have produced uh, heritage trails and guides. And in the case of Loch Ray, um, we started to, um, I suppose, first of all, audit the um, heritage resources within the town and to develop a, a digital trail and also to uh, produce a guide. So in total, we have 21 sites of interest. Um, as well as the um, digital guide, we also have a, a Z card, a little um, guide, pocket guide that people can pick up in the shops and the local businesses and just walk around and get to know their town. Currently, we are producing a story map uh, of um, the trails in Loch Ray. In addition to that, we felt that it was important to uh, to, I suppose, produce a small little uh, booklet on the rich medieval heritage of Loch Ray. So we have just produced it and we hope to launch it very soon. Uh, in that booklet, we um, give more details on those uh, 21 sites. We give the details of, I suppose, the history and the heritage of Loch Ray. And also we have documented uh, as much as we could of, uh, I suppose, any archaeological excavations and digs that took place in Loch Ray. Um, so we are constantly adding to, I suppose, the information we have. And as technology moves on, we migrate to different platforms and to make it available. We do feel that it's really important to, um, to give this information 
in as many formats as possible. Uh, so it's in paper format, it's in digital format, and um, it, we feel that this is really important. Education and awareness is a very, very important part of what we do as heritage officers. So in Galway, uh, we have put on uh, reading the landscape courses um, and that we've run them uh, throughout the county. And I suppose in the past year, we have migrated to online and we found that um, there's a huge uptake uh, in the courses. People really want to know about their own place and how they can read that rich landscape that they have. So to assist as well, uh, you know, the end user, uh, we have produced a publication uh, we, on reading the landscape. Uh, we're updating it currently and uh, because it's five years ago since we last produced the Reading the Landscape publication. But in that five years, there's a huge amount of additional information available. And that information uh, is, uh, a lot of it is available online, which is really, really uh, a great benefit. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, you would have had to go to your local library or national archives and national libraries. But now there's so much information on the local landscapes available online. Uh, we use heritagemaps.ie for example, an um, initiative uh, spearheaded by the Heritage Council and um, I suppose assisted by heritage officers. So we feel that the Reading the Landscape um, project is really important as an educational tool and as an educational resource uh, another project that we ran in partnership with Birdwatch Ireland, NUIG, uh, GMIT and a lot of the NGOs in Galway was Go Wild Camps because uh, we started to look and we found that um, there weren't really any camps um, for children uh, to find out about the natural heritage of their local area. So we all came together and developed these camps. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't deliver them last year, but... Um, the second uh, we uh, advertise the camps, we run them in different parts of the county, um, they, they sell out within minutes. Um, and the feedback we got is that um, some of the adults that would come along uh, asked, could we run Go Wild camps for adults? So we'd hopefully do that into the future. A very important aspect of the work of the heritage officers is working with and for our communities. Really, as heritage officers, we're just one person. But to make a difference, we need to work with our communities because it's the communities are the custodians of the heritage. So by us all working together and working in partnership, we can do so much for the heritage of our local places. So it's very important that we have that we're all aware of what we have uh, at the local level, because if we're not aware of what we have, then how can we manage what we've got and ultimately how can we protect it. So heritage officers work really, I suppose, we're, we're like a jigsaw of all of us coming together with our communities to showcase, to manage and protect the rich local heritage of our local areas and our counties and cities. If you would like to contact either Deirdre or myself, you can see our contact details there on the last slide. Thank you very much for listening to our presentation today. Hi, my name is Eugene Costello, and I'll be talking today about the cultural and natural heritage of livestock raising in Ireland's uplands. So today and in the recent past, there have been, I suppose, a few different perceptions of uplands. They can present people with a degree of uncertainty in that it's open mountainous terrain that, you know, people from lowlands may not be familiar with or comfortable with and they can present difficult terrain sometimes particularly in rocky areas and also then in a more distant past I suppose before the 1750s you would of course have had wolves also in Ireland's uplands. Going back a little bit further in time to the accounts that Tudor English authors um, have of Ireland they often refer to mountains and hills in Ireland as places where um, the so-called rebels would hide out. So, for example, Edmund Spencer, the famous poet, said that the Irish keep their cattle and live themselves the most part of the year in boonies, 
pasturing upon the mountain and waste wild places and removing still to fresh land as they depasture the former. And then George Carew, a little bit later in Kerry, in 1600, said that in the summer season they live on the milk and butter of their cows grazing on the mountains and in fastness, which holds this rebellion on foot longer than otherwise it would. And then economically too, in at least these early modern sources, um, such as the Down Survey, you often have bogs and hills kind of seen or portrayed as kind of useless places or empty places. So for example here, this is um, extract from the Down Survey in Wicklow, and it says that bog and unprofitable mountains. So it actually specifically refers to the mountains here as unprofitable. Um, but if we actually do a little bit of interdisciplinary research into the history of uplands, taking archaeology and oral history and also um, the documentary record into account, we can actually see that uplands in many cases were central to rural communities' lives, both from social and economic points of view. And in pre-modern times, before the 20th century, and especially before the mid-19th century, one of the main ways in which that importance um, was tapped into was through a form of transhumance known as bullying. So essentially transhumance is a practice in which um, people would move seasonally with livestock, um, usually from a lowland area, most often to an upland area. So moving between different environmental niches or environmental zones on a seasonal basis and in many parts of Europe this would still be practiced today and essentially you know really its advantage lies in the fact that um, you can take advantage of seasonal growth in places where there wouldn't otherwise be much growth for example mountains um, where you wouldn't have much growth in the winter um, you take an advantage of that seasonal growth while also getting livestock away from the home place um, for the summer. So that then frees up land around the home farm where you can then grow more crops. In late medieval and early modern Ireland this practice seems to have to some extent facilitated market interaction. So rather than it being a kind of um, I suppose primitive subsistence practice it was actually something that was bound up with commercialization of farming and links with the wider world. So, for example, you know, you have the importance across Ireland, but especially in the southwest of Ireland, of, of dairying. As you can see here, um, depiction of traders arriving at the coast of Munster, um, you know, Dutch traders arriving to purchase butter and cheese. So, in the archaeology of livestock herding in uplands, you can actually see that reflected in some of the, the hut sites. Um, where herders would have stayed. So, for example, in the um, Galtee Mountains in County Limerick, you would sometimes, in a substantial minority of sites, you would see these little um, storage structures either on the outside or in the inside. Um, and this is another example on the bottom um, from uh, County Kerry in um, Ibrahach. Uh, this would be a kind of crude internal store most likely for storing butter and keeping it um, cool. Seasonal mobility with livestock to uplands in some cases may also have been a solution for mineral deficiency in cattle. So for example this is a, an account from Michal Branach in um, Mom here in Kundinagalava, um, so kind of North Connemara just kind of um, on the southern border of uh, Joyce country. So he says, a ta mar derha galar a gol govehi a dugunchid a gala truer. Well, in Satana home he mra kramara agus wid ba ama finish lady in sanat a voidish duf hoof. Kurdish a gwid ba er kimin in shin agus laia sik je un gala trua. I think there might have been a misspelling there. But essentially, what um, this person is saying, Nihal, is saying here is that. Um, there was a disease which would um, afflict cattle, um, which they call the galarthrua, the, the pitiful disease. And in the old time, 
women of Connemara would go out with their cattle um, to the mountains and um, they would find um, black sage um, so that should actually be um, heeb hoof rather than dub hoof that's a misspelling and they used to put their um, cows grazing there and that, that would then cure the galartrua the pitiful disease and it seems you know based on the description that this may be a form of cobalt deficiency which is sometimes a factor on kind of um, lower sandy soils often by the coast now then there's the question of who moved with these livestock well um, in some accounts there is a kind of you get the impression that basically it would have been the whole village moving or whole settlement um, and that's the case you know we can see in William Miles account of bullying in Ackle Island He says that the entire population of several villages would have driven the cattle before them and migrated into the hills. But, you know, thanks to archaeological survey, we can see that that probably wasn't the case, at least in the 18th and 19th centuries. There simply wouldn't have been enough foot sites in those upland settlements to accommodate everybody um, coming up. Um, we can see this too in South Kalmara. This is uh, Orsanyach, where there would have been, you know, coastal townlands linked with inland hilly townlands and you can clearly see here this is the situation um, that I mapped out for the pre-famine period where the farmhouses would have greatly outnumbered the hut sites that survive in the hill pastures so they couldn't all have moved it would have been you know something more like you know 30 35 percent of people going up and those 30 35 percent at least by the 19th century would have been mainly young people and often girls as well um, so there would have been flexibility obviously you know these people would not have been more than a few kilometers away um, so people could come and go to some extent now in this kind of I suppose fascinating division of labor there would have been obviously um, some consequences to that you know separation of the community um, some people staying at home, most people staying at home, and then some moving up to the hills. Um, and we can see that in the oral history. So, for example, there are these stories, particularly from Mayo and also um, Western County Galway, where there would be these, I suppose, abductions or attempted abductions of girls um, at booly sites in the hills, these kind of upland um, herding sites where the girls would have been stationed overnight. Um, so for example in many of these stories there is often this kind of um, a trick is played on the men who are trying to abduct the young um, teenage girl. Um, essentially there would be a young boy, um, usually her um, five-year-old, six-year-old brother with her and the girl would start playing a tune and the boy would recognize the tune um, of course the words weren't being sung but he would know the words and the words would usually be something along these lines Cahar Cúigar Cú agus Púchal Atag Teacht Da Múda Teravalla agus Fógaré so basically means um, four people, five people, a hound and a boy um, are coming to um, abduct me go home and raise the alarm so anyway in the story the young boy would run home raise the alarm the community would come up and beat up the men who were trying to abduct um, the teenage girl so that's an example I suppose of kind of danger or risk at least in the pre-famine period um, but there's also definitely a sense of kind of um, reminiscence and uh, I suppose nostal nostalgia associated with the practice um, so in a kind of different song this is a song that would be sung today um, by some Shango singers in the West um, essentially it's the voice of a woman who is looking back on her teenage years in the hills when she was herding livestock she sings Veramsha Movalacht the Desagart Ud the Fosme Augustante, Dordig, Nabal, Timura, Nirvid, Shud, 
a chracht me i dus moige ach a greenk er na town of hip is to go na da gola so she's basically cursing the priest who married her and the the man who ordered her to the town they were not the ones who taught me in my youth when i was dancing on the pastures with the calves so it's highly romanticized but nevertheless gives a hint that perhaps um as you might expect it wasn't all risk or danger or uncertainty uh, in these uplands there was also perhaps a sense of freedom at least on a seasonal basis um for young people um a cultural heritage which has now been largely lost but that's kind of romantic but i just want to finish up on i suppose the idea of pastoralism and livestock grazing not being static it changing over time and also changing uplands over time um so there would be an environmental effects um as you can see here from this pollen diagram from Maumean um just south of Jais country um you can see highlighted in red at the top um the green getting more plentiful and the blue getting less plentiful so that's pointing to um woodlands I suppose kind of um receding and grassland um expanding in the late medieval and early modern period as a result largely of pastoralism and livestock grazing I think this has some potential implications for upland management today um because you know in nature 2000 there is a tendency to see um habitats as something that should be kept the same and that we should freeze um but as we know rural communities are changing um uh, people are not necessarily leaving wholesale but there is some decline and also there is more intensive grazing than ever as a result of deer and and also sheep so things are changing and habitats uh, are being affected so i think that you know just to finish historical lessons may play a role in actually guiding the change that is going to take place in many of these SACs for example pointing out where woodlands may have existed up until the 1700s this is just an example from Kerry where i pointed out um where woodlands existed up until the recent past and which are now largely gone so these could you know these could help to um capture carbon and also prevent um erosion um while keeping livestock in the landscape so you know true archaeology landscape history and place name research identifying these spaces where um woodland can regenerate um without compromising the heathlands which are protected or the boglands and also without compromising um farming uh, which people rely upon in the area so for example here in Kerry I found that it was mainly the the steep rocky slopes where woodland would have been common um so just to finish also you know highlighting the need for local cooperation that comes out quite strongly in the historical research um the idea of commons and if not reviving that completely nevertheless highlighting the need for local forums and for perhaps consultation between people uh, when deciding on on farming and on conservation and i think you know the new eips that are coming up um such as wild adapting nature are a great opportunity to work together and to integrate perhaps some historical lessons into future upland management so i i leave it at that and if you want to read a bit more about what i have done as regards um perhaps um the role of the past in upland management there is the name of that article there you can see hill farmers habitats and time that's up on the internet and also um if you're interested in bullying or transhumans i have a book out about that um published by Fidel and Brewer so um gravina margaret and uh thanks very much Okay, uh, my name is Pader Omohirthi and I'm a lecturer in Celtic Studies at Aberystwyth University and a research fellow at the University of Copenhagen. And my brief uh, today is to talk to you briefly about um, the Irish of Dohi Gheoghach and uh, Torvikeidi. Um, 
by means of a quick overview, and it is very quick. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the place, um, about language studies that have been done on the place, uh, some of the language features that you'll hear in the dialect of Dúchí uh, and Tuirvikéidí, um, some short comment on the history and culture of the language in the area. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about the the, uh, the present state of the language in the area, as well as talking about um, some of the future prospects of the language. So in terms of uh, place, then, uh, you've been hearing quite a lot about the geography um, and the geological features of the area. Uh, in linguistic terms, um, the area now classified as, as uh, the growth of, of areas of Dúchí Chóigach and uh, Túrvikéidí uh, have their origins, like all other um, state-designated growth of areas in Ireland, uh, in the Growth of Commission that was uh, set up in 1926 after the foundation of the state, um, to actually discern the areas which were still um, Irish-speaking areas and the degree to which they were Irish-speaking. The Commission uh, uh, identified two areas in particular, which they classified as Brach um, or partially Irish-speaking, and Fir or entirely Irish-speaking. Uh, and so you can see um, Turvikedi and Duhi uh, Kyoigach uh, there on the on on the map in front of you, um, and you can see that they're uh, bordered or surrounded by areas of white. The areas of white are um, Loch Mask and Loch Carib, and to a lesser extent, and the uh, where you wouldn't expect uh, water areas which are um, uninhabited. Um, uh, okay, so we see quite a stark um, we see quite a stark difference from this map going to the next map that I'm going to show you. The next uh, map is the uh, the Gaeltacht of the areas, the state designated Gaeltacht of the areas designated by uh, acts of the of the Eruchtas, um, uh, as they currently uh, exist. Uh, the Gaeltacht Act in 2020 or Achna uh, delineated 27 language planning areas. So these are areas uh, which, uh, for the purposes of language planning initiatives, are treated uh, are treated together. And the language planning uh, area of relevance uh, here is obviously Tuhi uh, and Tuirvikedi, which are treated as one, uh, which are treated as one um, language planning area, despite the fact that they. Uh, they cross the border, if you like, from Mayo uh, into uh, into uh, into Galway. Looking then at the, at the area in the context of the the Greater uh, Connacht um, Gaeltacht, uh, you can see that the uh, Chuigach uh, and Turvikedi are are in the middle. So starting from the north, we have uh, Mio Hua, uh, which uh, corresponds to the Barony of Eris. Mio here corresponding to uh, the part of the island of Achill, which is in the Gaeltacht, and the area across from it in the mainland, which uh, is also designated a Gaeltacht area. Uh, then uh, next down, heading south, is this really, really large area of Dúi um, Chioigach uh, and Tuir um, uh, geographically really uh, expansive. Uh, but of course, we know that um, uh, that quite a lot of that area is uh, is uninhabited uh, and uh, perhaps even uninhabitable. Um, and then uh, moving further south, uh, what I've classified there is Gwelfth which is um, uh, uh, simply the number of language planning uh, areas from taking us from Karna east uh, to um, uh, to the east uh, to east of Bowie City. Um, so I want to talk very briefly in terms of language studies, that is to say studies that have been done on the dialect of the area, on the language of the area um, previously. And I'm going to start uh, with um, Wilhelm Dögen, um, a German, uh, a German uh, linguist and phonetician uh, who's most famous for the uh, recordings of languages and dialects that he did, uh, uh, not just in Ireland, but across Europe at a very early stage of um, of, uh, of linguistic recording. Uh, he worked in Ireland between 1928 and 31, and he was greatly facilitated, especially in, Con in areas in Connacht, by Professor Thomas O'Molle, um, who himself was from Dúchy uh, uh, and was Professor of Irish in 
um, in NUI, and what is now NUI Galway. Uh, some of the speakers recorded uh, include Seamus Branach, a speaker in his 50s from Carnamona, but there are other speakers recorded by Doug in, in, in the, uh, and now made available, the records are now made available by the Royal Irish Academy um, at the website you see there. Uh, from all over the country, from from Antrim to uh, from Antrim to Cork. Uh, next is Professor Thomas O'Moyle. Um, as I said, O'Moyle himself was a, a native of of, of North Connemara and uh, published in 1936 a, a book called Unveiled Bio. It's not the only book that he published, but it is um, uh, it's worth particular mention here. The focus of the book is on idioms, traditional technical terminology and things like that, uh, weather terms. Uh, so it's, it's a really valuable, uh, a really valuable resource and was compiled actually from uh, the notes that Omwala used uh, to teach Irish undergraduates um, uh, in his role as professor in Galway. It's recently been re-edited. This um, attractive cover that you see is not the original. This is the, the version that's reissued uh, and edited by Professor Rory O'Higgins more recently. Um, the uh, next person that I want to mention is Heinrich Wagner, a Swiss uh, scholar and dialectologist who is responsible for uh, probably the greatest contribution to the study of Irish language dialectology, and that is uh, the Linguistic Atlas and Survey of Irish Dialects, four really large uh, volumes, uh, which were collected and compiled from a questionnaire put together by Wagner, uh, which set out to elicit particular grammatical terms, um, uh, the sound system of the dialects that he was interested in, and, uh, and um, word, particular word usages. It was compiled almost single-handedly by Wagner, um, largely uh, unfunded uh, by himself. It's a, it's a real uh, testimony um, and it includes a number of informants from the area, uh, from the Turvikedi area and uh, the uh, Karnamona uh, area also. Um, the most in-depth uh, study of the language of the area, however, is by uh, Sean de Borca, um, uh, who published uh, in 1970, The Irish of Tormacady, County Mayo, a phonemic uh, study. Um, Sean de Borca was a, a native of uh, Tormacady himself. He was a, went on to be a lecturer in, uh, in Irish at uh, University College Galway, now NUIG. Um, and it's the only book-length le book survey dedicated entirely uh, to the dialect of the area. The Irish of Termicadia and Carnamona are not, or Buhikyoikach, I should say, are not uh, identical, but they are broadly very, very similar. They're as, as close as any two um, uh, contiguous areas as could be linguistically. Um, in terms of language features, how you might recognise um, the Irish of the area, and this largely applies to both um, and the uh, you will hear uh, quite often the Mayo E, um, what I call the, what I call the Mayo E at any rate, um, and that is the uh, E in final position that uh, that you hear. So instead of Montrasna, which is what people would say sort of in in South Kalmara, um, in Mayo and in, in Duhi Yoigoch, you hear Montrasna. Sasana is inevitably referred to as Sasana. Rodella, Rodelli, and Agolawale, Um Oscal, you will also hear as Foscal, Glenya, instead of Glenya, you'll have Glany. Um, and uh, a morphological feature, um, uh, instead of Kafir, to say one must, Kafir or Kahir, um, Kafir or Kahir. Uh, uh, so these are just some of the features by by which you might recognise the you might recognise the dialect. Um, in terms of history and culture, um, the Irish Folklore Commission uh, in the 1930s and 60s uh, collected a huge amount of folklore all over the country, um, but they were particularly active in uh, parts of Mayo and uh, and Galway, with full and part-time collectors working on collecting folklore, song, local history, and what we might sort of generally term uh, shanachas. One of the uh, collectors uh, who worked particularly in Thorvikedi and in Dohikyoikach was Pruncius de Borca, um, who was himself from Tiernia in, in Carnamona. 
um, and he was a particularly uh, prolific uh, collector. And you see here uh, an excerpt from the, di from the diary that all the collectors kept, uh, an entry from 1936, which also um, gives us some insight into uh, the particular, a particular feature of the dialect. Dinish Tomaso Lydian Kopish Gale, the An Inu or Hul Nurhul there on machine, I was tortured Nahra Dadi in Anagal or in Plotnanina. Um so Thomas Lydian told us a story. They were all very surprised when they heard the machine, that is the recording machine that he was using, um, and they said that that nothing was beyond the uh, nothing was uh, beyond the, the intellect of man. Um, the other large collection, cultural collection, is the school's collection, or Bailuch on the Skull, uh, collected in the 1930s. And this is a collection of folklore made by school children and organised through the national school system. And among other things, it encouraged intergenerational transmission of traditional stories, history, legends, songs, prayers and beliefs, because the children were charged with uh, going to their uh, grandparents and collecting, uh, collecting this material. And it's material from uh, Kernamona has uh, recently been published by Alba Nicola Hold. Most uh, recently, however, um, uh, the era of Duhi Kyoike Kontorvikedi uh, has been in the news uh, in relation to another area, another aspect of the area's history, which is a bearing on Irish language. Some of you will recognise this image as that of Mailer Shoike, uh, the monolingual Irish speaker. Um, uh, erroneously uh, convicted of uh, a gruesome murder in the 1880s uh, and sentenced to death by uh, uh, an English speaking um, by an English speaking uh, court. So there are two tragedies involved in the Mom Thrasten case. The first is the brutal murders themselves. Um, uh, and then of course the second is the execution of an innocent man for a crime uh, he didn't commit because uh, because the state at the time was indifferent to the fact that he, that he was an Irish speaker. And not only that, uh, that not that only that he was an Irish speaker, but that he was part of an Irish speaking um, community. Uh, so two recent books uh, on this are uh, the book Egoid by Sean O'Curran uh, and uh, The Montrass Murders by Margaret uh, Kelleher. And that brings us to the present state of uh, the language in a in a particular way, because it's no wonder that one of the recent books on the Montrasna case was written by Sean O'Curran, the first ever language commissioner appointed by the state to ensure that the Irish state met its, met its own statutory obligations with regard to serving Irish-speaking communities. Um, Sean O'Curran resigned as a language commissioner, as on Commissioner Tango in 2013, because he felt he was left with no other option on account of continued failure at the state to meet the very modest obligations that the state had set for themselves. So it's not difficult to see the connection between uh, 2013 and the 1880s in the case of Will Roshoyge when he says, requiring the people of the Goethe to conduct their business in English with state agencies flies in the face of any policy which suggests that the survival of the Goethe is on the state's agenda. So in terms of the survival of uh, uh, Irish in the area. Um, these figures belong to uh, the townland of Almdran uh, in uh, Fionna, um, which is the area which is right, right on the border between Mayo uh, and Galway, and it's one of the strongest Irish-speaking areas on the Mayo side uh, of the of that border. And so we can see from 2016 to 20, from 2011 to 2016, rather, rather. Um, a fall of uh, a significant fall in the number of daily Irish speakers, um, uh, which is exactly matches the uh, fall in terms of the population in that period as well, which means that that Irish speakers are dying off and are not being replaced um, are not being replaced by uh, the community. Um, this, of course, is not happening. Uh, in a vacuum, this is all relevant to the reasons why Sean O'Curran uh, uh, resigned. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, they are they are related. In terms of the language uh, future, in uh, 2015, uh, the uh, area, one of the the language planning areas, um, launched their plan tango or their language plan. Um, for the period 2018 to 2025, uh, setting out how this 
decline can be uh, addressed. Uh, and so uh, it's not a, an, 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 an on positive note to end on, but to say that there are um, significant challenges to the language in uh, in the area going forward. Um, the uh, the language plan involves the uh, employment of a language planning officer, um, along with lots of other uh, innovative uh, and uh, dare I say exciting um, measures to try and uh, support the Irish language community that still exists uh, in the area and that exists quite quite strongly in some places in the area. Um, uh, this is not happening in a vacuum, however, this is happening uh, in, uh, or should be happening in conjunction with lots of other, uh, with lots of other organisations, not least the, uh, the new uh, Geopark. Thanks Trish. Uh, I suppose if, to give a quick summary um, would be this, yeah, there is uh, cultural as well as natural heritage in the region, and that we should pay attention to to, to both. Uh, I suppose my main my main message, um, and but I suppose it that takes time because um, we've only just kind of started this conversation. And there's a lot of ingredients between geology and uh, the Angrelge, I guess uh, you know, and, and many other things. So it will be it will take a while. It will take a um, sorry, uh, what are the difficulties? Um, well, I suppose um, you know there's uh, a lot of the work that a lot of the work that uh, we do um, in the heritage office is is with uh, engaging engaging with communities, and um, uh, there's lots of potential to um, to work with uh, communities. Um, on various uh, heritage projects, um, I suppose, and a lot of the work we do really is about raising awareness. And um, I think uh, awareness is is very important. And I think when um, people realise the the I suppose the value of the local heritage, um, they're very willing and um, very willing to engage with it and to um, to to promote that heritage and, cons and conserve it. So um, yeah, just really the opportun opportunities, um, lots of opportunities for uh, for various projects, and even uh, within the uh, with uh, within the the listening to some of the talks, listening to some of the talks um, yesterday as well, and just working with the with the various stakeholders, whether that's um, farmers or local communities or the various agencies. So um, yeah, just really lots of potential. Okay, uh, increasing geological education in the area. I think, first of all, I think there's huge potential because what I tried to illustrate is is the the great diversity of geology that's present in the in the geopark area and the fantastic stories that that the different rocks tell of different environments through time that built Ireland. Um, increasing geological education, I would uh, defer to Ben and Amarin essentially to uh, engage with the school children in the area and teach them some of the stories uh, and with hands-on experience of the rocks whenever they can get them back into the field and I think there's a few demonstrations of that later today where they can look, look at a rock and imagine the environments and the processes that created it. But it's also Michael asked us to, to pick out a couple of key aspects that the geopark should focus on and I, I think the Geopark needs to realise that it has a fantastic diversity and some of the stories told there are better told there than anywhere else in Ireland. And they should pick those out and focus on them uh, as key selling points for the Geopark. I can just come in there at, um, uh, to answer one question from uh, Michael Hegarty uh, about um, one or two aspects uh, that are important for the geopark to focus on in the short term. Um, I would just like to point out that it is uh, a responsibility of the of the geopark uh, to liaise uh, with um, the Irish language community, with Irish speaking communities um, in the area where they are where they are based, uh, and um, 
uh, and uh, to liaise with the uh, language planning officer, who I think is also here, Stefan Choyke, uh, in the area. Um, that uh, really the geopark has a, has a, has a significant responsibility uh, to the communities uh, in the area and that, that uh, pertains uh, to the language as much as to anything else, if not more so. I'll just say, if I can, um, as regards one or two things that the geopark could pick up on. Um, just, I know I was, I was talking about Kerry there a good bit, but, but yeah, I, an important thing both for, you know, awareness yeah, so of archaeology and history is to, you know, is, I suppose, you, be communicating you, with people on the ground, you know, obviously it goes in with the language as well. Um, but, you know, it just helps. And I, I'm sure you're, you're doing that anyway, like, um, but, you know, that you have to have do some hours now, but um, when things get back to normal, um, there doesn't have to be, you know, there's nothing better than a kind of a, a walking workshop, a walking workshop, so to speak, or a walking seminar through the landscape to, um, to really highlight, uh, you know, underground, um, you know, certain stories or habitats of importance are um, no. nodes in the landscape, um, you know, um, interesting cultural heritage that anchor the, the, you know, into the physical and also intangible heritage of the place. So Ben has just asked me if I had all the money in the world, where would I spend it on geological research in the area? So I would um, hire the biggest drilling rig and drill across that buried contact between Connemara and South Mayo and see what it's like. Um, because that, that strip of rock that covers it is a continual frustration but it allows us to use our imaginations and as geologists like to do, arm wave about how things came together rather than having the data to prove things. So in some ways it would be good, in some ways it might spoil the story a bit. So get out, look at the rocks and use your imagination.